Presented by Caltech. I'd now like to introduce Daniel Magley. Daniel is currently a sophomore majoring in electrical engineering. He participated in SURF this past summer under the mentorship of Dr. Huck Chu. Hi. As said previously, my name is Daniel Magley, and I'm presenting to you my research that I did in True Lab under Professor Chu on hydroionic microthrusters for propulsion and fluid. That's a bit of a mouthful right now, but I promise it will make sense very quickly. So, to start out, I want to paint you a picture. And to do this, I need you to consider a generic person. We're going to call this person Bob. Now, Bob's had a pretty rough week. On Sunday, Bob had a heart attack due to his cardiac arrhythmia, and he fell over. So, luckily, we were able to get him into the hospital and get scans on him, fix him up, find out what the problem was, and schedule him for surgery starting the next week, getting on, him on rounds of antibiotics. But, unfortunately for Bob, on Monday, the doctors realized the scan showed he had a tumor in his kidney. So, it's looking pretty bad for Bob right now. He's going to need that heart surgery for that pacemaker implant, but, and then afterwards, we're going to have to go on ahead and start him on chemo. As if that wasn't enough, the stress from all this on Bob and the physical stress from his different ailments allowed for an opportunistic infection of MRSA from the nail he fell on to start in his shoulder. So Bob's going to have to go on some pretty rigorous oral antibiotics for a couple weeks before he can go on ahead and get the surgery, which he will then have to have another round of antibiotics afterwards and then go on chemo. So this is a pretty painful process for Bob. And what I want to propose to you is something that would make Bob's life a lot easier. What if we had a miracle device that we could just stick in Bob's arm, have it swim on up to the site of infection, using targeted drug delivery, deliver the antibiotics to the site of the infection, proceed to swim on over to his heart, deposit a microimplant. Those are things that actually exist. If you look at companies like Medtronic and Boston Scientific, they have those on the market right now. And be able to go on ahead, switch over to the lymphatic system, and swim down to his kidney. We're using gene therapy to be able to treat the cancer that's in his kidney. Next, we'd be able to have it swim on out of his leg and pop it right on out. So this may seem very sci-fi and very far off, but it's actually not really. This is a topic that has been pursued well since the 80s, and there's been a lot of work that's been going on. The most successful work so far has been using what we call non-onboard power supplies, external power supplies. So things such as using magnetic coils to control devices as they move throughout the body. These have been extremely successful and have been used to successfully treat things such as tumors within the eye. So what I want to do, the final thing that I want to put on this painting for you of this device that moves around the body is I'm going to argue that it should be powered by an onboard power supply. If we can have it with an onboard power supply, we can eliminate the need for external equipment such as MRI machines, making the process cheaper and simpler for the patient. This would also go on ahead and free up valuable time on machines such as MRIs, which are already in very high demand in the ER. If you've ever had to sit in an ER waiting to use an MRI, it can take a little while. Finally, if we have it powered with an onboard power supply, we pave the way for this device to exist constantly inside the person's body and perform in vivo diagnostics and treatment. So. This sounds like a really great idea. Why doesn't this exist yet? There's a physical barrier right now where the propulsion methods that we use to move things inside the human body take up more power than we can supply with current onboard power supplies. The best of which would be a biofuel cell. This would be able to provide constant power indefinitely for a period of weeks to months. The current best biofuel cell, like right off the line published this past summer, would be able to produce 204 microwatts on the current best propulsion method, which uses 250 microwatts for each body length per second that that device can move. The body length is not the body length of the person, it's the body length of the device. If you have something inside you moving out of body length per second for your body length, I recommend going to the ER for different reasons. <laughs> so another thing to take in consideration is the speed of this device. Even if we were able to supply this 250 <coughs> microwatts, moving at speeds of 100 micrometers per second, one micrometer per second isn't very practical. So we want something that can move fast and be efficient. And to introduce the rest of the field, I want to go on ahead and introduce to you to something that if you read a literature review on microfluidic devices, you'd see very commonly. So what we have here is the speed and body lengths per second that devices were able to achieve. And on the x-axis, we have Reynolds number. What Reynolds number is, 
is it's an indication kind of of the size of environment that you're in. When you're at low Reynolds number, you have the ratio of inertial to viscous forces, where viscous forces are dominating over the inertial forces. When you're at high Reynolds number, you have the inertial forces domi dominating. Think about this. Think about moving your hand through air versus moving your hand through corn syrup. In corn syrup, it's a lot more viscous. So when we're looking at the human body, we're looking at 0.001. This would be about 1 micrometer, the size of your capillaries, all the way up to 10. This would be on the order of a millimeter for your main circulatory system. This is really the range where we're considering devices that could go inside your body and move around. On this graph, you also know I have a little key over here. The black dots are the devices that use viscous-based momentum, or viscous-based propulsion. Viscous-based propulsion is highly efficient because viscous forces are dominating at these low Reynolds numbers. However, you might notice they're fairly slow. So while they're efficient and have the most power efficient among them, momentum forces tend to be a lot faster. But because of their low efficiency in terms of by length per second per microwatt that they consume, they don't tend to last very long. Uh, this one, the 100 by lengths per second, only lasted about a fraction of a second. So what we did, our intuition was, what if we could go on ahead and create a method that derives its efficiency from viscous forces, but has its end propulsion method be momentum transfer? This would give us a hybrid, something that would be very fast due to the momentum transfer and very efficient due to deriving its efficiency from viscous forces. And to do this, I want to introduce to you electroosmosis. Consider a solid block that we go on ahead and put inside an ionic fluid. What's going to happen is you're going to have ion deposition onto the surface. This just happens innately, and it's going to be very small in quantity. But irregardless, you're going to get a net charge on this solid surface. This is going to attract opposite charged particles. And what we know is that at a Debye length away, if you apply an electric field to this solution, we have an equation that gives us the exact velocity for the fluid that gets propelled at that length away. You have these ions, you apply the electric field, it's going to push them. With this helmholtz schmalowski equation, the important thing to note is that the electric field is proportional to the velocity of this layer that we create. Keep that in mind. So next, what if we had a low viscous environment? When we consider the viscosity of the fluids, uh, what this is, is you can think of this like sandpaper. If we have a layer of fluid moving in a low viscosity environment, it's like you have two layers of glass on top of each other. The one moving on the bottom isn't really going to drag the one on top very well. But if we switch to a high viscous environment, what we have at low Reynolds number, it's like you have really coarse sandpaper. And you're going to get very efficient transfer from one layer to the next. And that dampening that you saw before isn't going to happen. So in this way, we have a method that derives its efficiency from the viscosity of the environment. Next, because what we're doing is essentially moving a bulk fluid, if we took, say, a tube and lined the walls and applied an electric field, we'd be able to have a velocity profile come out the back, propelling the device forward, using the momentum transfer between the fluid that we propelled out the back, pushing the device forward. So in this way, we have our hybrid method if we use electroosmosis. It derives its efficiency from the viscous forces and its speed from the momentum transfer. So now that we had this basic design, we knew that we wanted to use a cylinder to optimize this boundary condition that occurs from electroosmosis. And with cylinders, we want to go on ahead and find an optimal aspect ratio, the ratio of the diameter to the length of the tube. So to do this, we went ahead and ran two simulations, one in which we simulated the velocity that would occur inside the channel of the fluid in it. And from this velocity, we would be able to go on ahead and using an equation that we derived, calculate the momentum transfer force that would propel it forward. Next, we ran a second simulation where we took our device and propelled it through blood at one centimeter per second and took the drag forces acting on our device and subtracted them from the momentum forces. What we found from this is an optimal channel diameter between 1,000 micrometers and 1,500 micrometers. We went ahead and used the 1,000 micrometer as our design because we wanted the smallest device possible. So now that we had the design, the next thing we had to take into consideration was how are we going to power this? We're trying to use an onboard power supply, which has never been demonstrated before. So we needed a very quick and easy, robust method to provide enough power to move our device. To do this, we used an aluminum air battery. All this is is a gold cathode and an aluminum anode. The aluminum on one side oxidizes, and oxygen 
gets reduced at the cathode. This creates a voltaic cell generating our voltage on either side of our device, which the voltage separated by distance creates the electric field that propels our electroosmosis. We went on ahead and submerged this in saline solution at 7680 microsiemens per centimeter, which is the approximate medium of what blood is, depending on uh, red blood cell concentration. So the voltage graph looks like this. And the important thing to note from this is that the voltage started very high, indicating a high electric field, high velocity, and then got down to a steady state. So with our device, we would expect this to start out moving very quickly and then slow down until it gets to a very steady state decay. Next, we wanted to go on ahead. We said, all right, we have a battery powering this, but is it actually moving fluid? So to test this, we separated two channels with a wall in which we embedded our device and applied two wires to either side. We went on ahead and applied a voltage across the device, which at this point was gold and gold instead of gold aluminum. So it's an inert device. When we applied voltage, we clearly saw that when we deposited 200 microliters of propylene glycol on one side, a blue dye, using particle velocimetry, or dye velocimetry in this case, we went on ahead and we were able to track the movement through the center channel getting an average flow rate using the volumes of the channel. From this average flow rate, we were able to derive an average velocity of what was moving through our center channel of our device. This was 0.586 centimeters per second. So this is fairly fast. This is half a centimeter per second, and we can expect our device should be moving at about this average velocity. Next, now that we knew we were pumping fluid, we were powering a device, we wanted to go on ahead and see if we could actually get the device moving. So we took our device with AU and aluminum and put a hydrophobic polymer on top so that it would float when we stuck it in water. And what happened when we deposited it was it traced out this heart-shaped pattern until it finished down to an eventual stop. This is the velocity graph. When we took this experiment, we used an overhead camera to track the position of the device and knowing the frame of the environment that we had in, we were able to get the distances between frames and knowing the frame rate, get the timing. Thus, we were able to calculate the velocity. What you see here is just as predicted by the voltage data. It started out very quickly and then quickly decayed down to an eventual steady state where it rode out till zero. This is in very high agreement with what we saw with performance of the battery. Next, if you zoom in on the first couple of data points, you'll see an acceleration period up into a max velocity. This max velocity was 5.24 centimeters per second. This translates to about 175 body lengths per second. This is pretty significant. So we were very excited about this number. But if we had a fast device, it didn't really mean anything unless we could go on ahead and get a high efficiency out of it. But before we move on to that, the last thing to note, we went on ahead and integrated over this entire velocity curve to get the average velocity. This was 0.583 centimeters per second. This is within 1% agreement of that 0.586 centimeters per second that we got as the flow rate moving through the device. So, so far, we have very high correlation between our voltage data and our flow rate data, indicating that we can safely say it's electroosmosis propelling this device. So finally, the power usage. How efficient was this? To test this, we simply took our device with AUAU, deposited in saline solution, and ran a voltage across it of 250 millivolts. This was the average voltage from the voltage data graph. When we went ahead and did that, tracking the current of 14.7 microamps that was flowing into the device using P equals VI, we were able to go on ahead and find out that we were using 3.68 microwatts. This translates to being about 100 times less of power than prior methods. You might recall back that the one before was using 250 microwatts and it was getting one body length per second. Here we use 3.68. So let's put this all in perspective now. So you recognize this graph, this is our old friend. On here we have our prior highest efficiency of 250 microwatts per body length per second. And we have our prior fastest device. Up here we have our device, the hydroionic microthruster. It achieved a speed of 175 body lengths per second as its max speed and for its average speed had an efficiency of 189 nanowatts per body length per second. This means that we not just exceeded the prior fastest devices, but we had operation times that were magnitudes longer and we had efficiencies that were 10 to the third times better. 
this is huge. This is a very big deal because up until now it had been like getting two times better power requirement usages and whatnot. Getting this 10 to the third broke that power barrier and is essentially what allowed us to have an onboard power supply propelling our device. So now that we have this amazing device, what we're doing right now is we're integrating on an IC onto the, the device. We're switching from an aluminum air battery to a biofuel cell. And we're going on ahead and taking three of our thrusters and positioning them. By actuating each of these three thrusters, we should be able to go on ahead and get three-dimensional control out of this. And since each of these are essentially just pumps, hooking on a reservoir with a pump on there to be able to move it to a target site and deliver a drug payload. So to finish, I want to go on ahead and thank my surf donors, the Kirk and Marjorie Dawson family. And I'd like to thank you, the audience. Any questions? Yes. So the cylinder is 100 micrometers in diameter? 1,000 micrometers. Uh, I'm sorry, 1,000 micrometers. Yes. And in a blood vessel? Uh, blood vessels, so if you consider like your main circulatory tract, this is going to be on the order of one millimeter all the way up to five millimeters. So essentially what you're looking at is right now we have the range to go to upper parts of your arm and down through your main circulatory system. We're also looking at scaling down to 100 micrometers. But what we have right now would be able to go on ahead and travel through, say, spinal fluid, going from one side of your spine all the way up to your brainstem, which has great promise for treating meningitis. Yes? So how do you direct the movement through the body? Oh, that's a really good question. OK, so uh, what we're considering doing is going on ahead and having uh, about five other implants positioned throughout the body and one central cavity. Each of these acts as antennas that go on ahead and transmit and find the angle at which the device is at in a three-dimensional axis. And from there, we'd be able to triangulate the position of the device relative to our center and go on ahead and figure out exactly where the device is. From that, using a control, external control circuit, be able to actuate our three motors to go on ahead and reorient and have it move in the velocity that we desire. Yes? Yep. So is this just a, a viscosity problem, or do you actually care? Like, will the are you worried about the device functioning differently in the presence of all these biomolecules versus your, your other condition? So, because we made this match the conductivity of blood, mm -hmm. uh, since all this really relies on is the conductivity for the power dissipation you get for heat loss and things like that, um, we're not really worried about that. What we were worried about is if blood cells would say clog it. And so that's why we start out at such a large diameter, because if we get that large diameter, it's very hard to clog. And so scaling it down, this effect becomes more efficient. And so it would have been easier to go on ahead and demonstrate this at 100 micrometers or 10 micrometers. But because we got it working at such a large diameter, we don't have to worry about blood cells clogging it. And it's much bigger, so just push them aside as it moves along. Any other questions? Yes. How do you compensate for the uneven velocity of the medium that it's working in? Ah, so because we're at low Reynolds number, what we have is laminar flow. So the media that it's working in is essentially going to have a very even velocity profile that it's moving through. Within uh, your capillaries and your blood, you actually don't get much variation in the velocity if you took a cross section. But in terms of like, if you're closer to the heart or farther away in like extremities, you're right, the velocity would vary. And in that case, we would just uh, compensate by adjusting how much force we're propelling the device by. All right. All right, thank you.